From the Dallas On Air Studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas, this is Fulfillment right here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your host, the Mega Bomber, PJ Dunn. All right, welcome, 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 welcome to Fulfillment. This is Season 3. We're looking at Episode 11 today. And our topic will be the Asian films and the influence and impact of pop culture, specifically here in the West. And so we've got a great lineup for you here today that we're going to talk about. Johnny, this was something that we've been wanting to do for a while. And so yes. can you believe it? Day's finally here. <laughs> 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 been been very much excited about this one for a while. So I'm glad you guys uh, were able to hold off for me. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you guys who maybe are just tuning in for the first time, uh, you may want to go ahead and subscribe and like if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, but this is what we do. This is a show all about films. And we talk about films. We talk about the directing, the acting. We talk about collectibles even. So if you just love films and you just love talking about the impacts that they make on you, then you have found the correct show to watch. So sitting at my right is my right-hand man, that is Johnny Flicks. Good morning, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. And that big booming voice behind the camera, sometimes in front of the camera, is Kazak. Greetings and salutations, campers. Welcome to DallasOnAir.com. Yes. <laughs> so let's just dive right in because we've got a lot of juicy stuff to talk about. So usually, to get started in our first segment, we talk about the films or the streaming services that we've watched certain films on. Uh, so you get an idea of what it is that we particularly seem to favor. You can tell by the things that we pick, so you get a real quick understanding of what Kazak watches is not necessarily what I'll watch, or what Johnny watches is not necessarily something that Kazak watches. No, right mind watches what Kazak watches. <laughs> right? And so when you see that, you can go, I'm going to watch the show because I I, I just have this bond with, with Kazak, or I have this bond with, with me, the Vega Bomber, or maybe it's even Johnny Flicks. But either way, three different perspectives, but still loving movies. So I think that's how we break that down. So with just seen it, I'm going to go ahead and get that started first and let you know what I've seen. And then we're going to go around the room and see what the fellas have seen as well. So what I have seen is, and I was saying this before, and I've been hyping this up for a while because I wanted to see it last year when it was supposed to come out, is A Quiet Place 2. Yes. That's right. I saw it, though, in the theater, and I saw it with the Dolby Sound. Because this movie deals heavily with sound design, and in my opinion, horror movies are made are made made and broken based off the visuals and the sound. If you will, the visuals hit you from the front door, but the sounds hit you from the back door, right? And sometimes it's what you don't see, but what you hear that actually sends your mind into this crazy place. So, a quiet place too. You, you it's going to come out on um, uh, Paramount TV, uh, Paramount Plus. In about 45 days. So I love the fact that they're going to have you go see this movie in the theater. And then later on, if you decide you don't want to go out for whatever reason, then you can watch it at home. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to be cheated because I absolutely loved it. So this is a film that picks up where the first one left off. So John Krasinski is the person who directed this film. He's also in the film. So he wrote, he wrote, he directed, wrote, and produced this film and acted in actually so that's like a it's a quadruple thing it stars his real life emily blunt who plays uh, evelyn abbott and then there's the two children noah jupe and millicent simmons who millicent simmons actually is a hearing impaired actress hmm. so you're getting a real version it's not somebody acting like they're deaf you get the real and so what they did with this film johnny was they said okay in the first one it was all about keeping it contained to just this family. So they introduce you to this family, how they're living, the things that they've done to tamp down sounds so that they can live. And by the way, Emily Blunt's uh, pregnant in this one. Evelyn's pregnant in the first one. In the second one, she's already had the baby, and now it's about how do we venture out? Because the first one was genius that it stayed in and helped you build the universe. But this second film, Quiet Place 2, takes you out and says, well, who else is out there? Maybe there are other survivors. And then who are these survivors? And who, are they going to be friendly or are they going to see you as, you know, danger because you might be making sounds that might get them killed? Mm -hmm. So self-preservation could kick in. So this film adds in uh, Cillian or Killian Murphy. I've been calling him Killian Murphy, but I think it's Cillian Murphy. Is that right, Kazak? I'll verify it. Okay, okay, he's going to verify. I just see it as, as Killian Murphy. So he was Scarecrow in Batman. So he plays Emmett. 
And he's one of the people out there that they're going to encounter. There's also Jaiman Hansu is in this film as well. And I love the, the turn that he takes in this. But it keeps the focus, though, on this family. Now, one of the most oh, interesting things. It is Killian Murphy. You're right. It is K? Yeah. Love it then. All right. I've heard a lot of people pronounce it as C. So I guess those guys better take a look at that. <laughs> so <laughs> because I can imagine if you pronounce somebody's name wrong, yeah, you know, they're probably upset about it. Um, so what's interesting here is if you didn't see the first one, you, what's wrong with you? Go see it right away. And then you need to watch the second one. But you won't have a waste of time watching this because it's incredibly thought out. Mm. It's the sound design is incredible because they let you hear it from the hearing impaired person's view, which means to hear nothing. And then from the rest of the family, which does have their hearing, and then how they're dealing with these same creatures that have supersonic hearing and can hear anything. And whenever they hear something, they attack anything that makes sound. Now, we learned in the first one that if there's a waterfall or some loud noise, you could talk loud because it can't distinguish between the waterfall and your voice. It just hears noise, right? And so since it's used to hearing that, so that's how the father teaches the children not to be afraid. He says, you gotta, if you're going to talk you got to get around something that's noisier and louder than you, which is really genius. And so it takes all these thoughts that you wouldn't thought about and, and it, into it. And then also the kids, there's a reverse. So in the first one, it's the parents trying to protect kids. And in the second one, you see the kids step up hmm. and you see how they're trying to protect the parent, right? So, and, you know, so I like the idea that they didn't come back and say, let's just do part two is bigger and better and all that stuff. They said, no, this actually can go different places. And it does. So for people who like horror films, I think you'll love this. I think the acting here is standout. Um, when you see it, you believe it. The sheer terror that Noah Jupe puts on his face as the young boy having to look after a mom with a baby, mm. <laughs> right? And then Millicent Simmons as the older, more teen, more angsty, more, well, I don't have to do this. Why, you know, who's trying to show who she is and how she can do her own thing and she doesn't need mom to try to explain everything to her or whatever. So having that, plus these new characters, now gives you something where you can say, wow, this actually has grown and gone somewhere to where now you have to watch a third one and be a crime if they didn't, but I think they're already talking about it. Hmm. So A Quiet Place 2, this is a film that I think is going to bring people back into the theater again because the theater experience is what stands out more. So I looked at the numbers just to see what happened. Uh, this was made on a budget of $61 million already. Uh, just two and a half weeks in, it's done 138.6 million. So this is going to be this is on its road to beat even Godzilla as, in terms of the most top grossing film since the pandemic era, mm. right? So it's on its way, and I'm pretty sure it will more than likely pass it. So if you haven't seen this film, I will definitely say this is a film worth watching. The craft is great. The acting is great. The plot is great. The storyline's great. Don't try to nitpick it and go, well, why didn't they do this? If this is, you know, I've just seen people do that. And it's, it's kind of like, well, everybody doesn't think like you. And they're thinking set based off of what that story is. And everybody likes to read their own into it. Well, if I was there, I would have done this. And it's like, come on think about it. <laughs> they don't think like you. <laughs> They've had a different experience, right? We've never been attacked by meteors with creatures that came out and started going at us, so it's easy to say what you might do. We haven't? <laughs> <laughs> that's how I was, I was getting to the Trump administration. I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Maybe that's wizard people. I don't know. That's, that's an entirely different bit. I'm, I'm sorry. That would be show, who needs show. to be quiet place to. <laughs> 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 Johnny, what have you seen recently? Uh, my just seen it is the remake of Papillon. Uh, ah. And um, interesting film. I, I enjoyed it. However, okay. I will say, so this was, this was a remake in 2017. Right. Uh, director is Michael Noer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Right. He's from Denmark. Okay. Um, actually, might have another film that he did that I'm interested in seeing um, hmm. also. Uh, that one's called Before the Frost, and it's about a Danish farmer in the 1800s that's struggling to survive and has to sell his farm and his daughter and all sorts of things like that. So, Okay. Kind of interested in checking that one out because I think he has a really interesting perspective on personal dynamics interpersonal dynamics there um mm. from watching this film so what's interesting about this film for me is it's a remake of 
an old Steve McQueen film mm -hmm. uh, with Dustin Hoffman in it also. And so we've got Charlie Hunnam playing the character that Steve McQueen plays in the original and Rami Malek replacing Dustin Hoffman. Interesting. Okay. Which Now that brings hmm. up a really interesting point for me because okay. I think Rami Malek is just a phenomenal actor mm -hmm. and, and I hadn't connected the dots between my interest in him as a, as an actor mm -hmm. and my interest in Dustin Hoffman as an actor, because mm. You can't ignore the fact that Dustin Hoffman has done some pretty phenomenal roles. Oh, for roles. sure. Of course. And, for sure. And there's some real similarities there, I think. Sure. Gotta say, though, mm -hmm. really disappointed in the performance from Rami Malek on this one. Yeah. I, I think it was, frankly, pretty flat, and I think he has a lot more chops than that. Yeah. Um, so, as much as I liked the film, and I think w where... Um, even though some of what was written about mm -hmm. um, in the in the book in the first place has been debunked, mm -hmm. not entirely sure. I believe all of the debunking, but right, right. but we'll we'll say okay. most people believe that it's been debunked. That's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. It still pointed out um, the extreme inhumanity of. Uh, the French prisons in French Guiana in the, in the 1930s and forties. Um, and it got them shut down. So mm. I think that's a very good thing. Um, wow. you know, personally, I, I can connect this a little bit with like, um, uh, cool hand Luke. Mm -hmm. That was a phenomenal film about mm -hmm. prisons in the mm -hmm. South of America. Mm -hmm. Um, um, a lot of similarities there. Mm -hmm. But what I would say about this particular film, the remake from 2017, is go watch the original. Yeah. I haven't watched the original, but yeah. I don't think this one's worth watching. I think yeah. if you're going to watch the film at all, go watch the original with Steve McQueen mm -hmm. and, and Dustin Hoffman. I yeah. think that's going to be the definitive version. Yeah. See, and we're flipped because I've seen the original, which is great. Hoffman yeah. is great. Um, and I haven't seen this 2017 remake. And I would say this about uh, Remy Malik. Um, I think he's a um, I think he's a good actor. I think he's streaky though. And, yeah. And I don't know why I don't know that that's him though. It right. could be the way he's being directed, or it could be the interpretation of how the screenplay if it shifted things. I don't know. Because when I saw him in The Little Things, he wasn't very good at all in that. Yes. One. I right. didn't buy him at all as an officer or detective, whatever. It just And same thing, flat and all that sort of thing. Now, this is not to say that this means Remy Malik can't act and he's not good. I mean, I know he's on Robot Chicken and he's – so he's got Mr. presence. Robot. He definitely has presence. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah, to me, because, like, when I look at what he did with, for example, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, yes. what he did – we all know that Freddie Mercury's just loved. <laughs> yes. Right? And we know that M Remy Malik didn't sing. He was lip syncing. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. But see, Taron Edgerton, when he played Elton John, <laughs> sang, danced, and acted. Mm -hmm. All that was in acting at the same time. And so I tend to... And he's a surprise because I just seen him in The Kingsman. I didn't think he was anything special in The Kingsman. Right. But to see that he could level up like that and do that. So, And then the fact that Remy Malik got a, an award... You know, for that. And I'm like, Taron Edgerton was 10 times better as Elton John than he yeah. was. But I also get it's what you were going up against and also how people were judging things. But Taron Edgerton had to go up against 1917 and apparently mm -hmm. Parasite and Ford versus Ferrari and Joker and a bunch of films. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I'm just kind of like, yeah. So with That's me, a big pack there. <laughs> this might be, yeah. And so for me, Remy Malik, I think is, is good. Yes. I think some people overrate him to a certain degree because yeah. I've seen him be very streaky. And again, I don't know if that's just him. Or just somewhat having me to do with the direction, right? Yeah. That he was under. Yeah. In the screenplay. What do you think, Isaac? Um, I I'm going in with neither one of these under my belt. I really am. Okay. Uh, I've seen the previews for the remake, and it's just like, okay, that looks kind of interesting. And again, I like Charlie Hunnam as an actor. I like Rami Malek. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, like I said, it 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 sounds like as though this is another one of those where you didn't need to remake it. It's yeah. another one of those where who asked for it, you know, you, <laughs> you have a guy who you have a director who really likes the film said, okay, let's go ahead and remake this. And it just feels 
unnecessary. It do, mm. It's it's one of those films that doesn't need the modern day remake, from what I can tell from you guys. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so I think it, in this case, like definitely. This, sounds like one of the skip. And again, it's a shame because I think Charlie Hunnam is really kind of being wasted as an actor when he winds up in these terrible projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I will say that Charlie Hunnam really like put himself into this role for sure. Mm -hmm. I understand he he lost forty pounds during filming this. Uh, <laughs> To, because of the the solitary confinement oh okay element of the film okay yeah yeah i mean you sense. could see it in him so he pulled a christian bale huh? yes <laughs> yes <laughs> wow it always amazes me when when we see actors do that sort of thing hey k Zach, what about you what have you seen all right, so for me, uh, we are getting a third entry from Disney Plus in the uh, miniseries category, and that's going to be Loki, uh, starring Tom Hiddleston returning to his role uh, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, in this one, we have the character Loki, uh, who, uh, thanks to the uh, 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 efforts that were made in, uh, Avenger in the Avengers Endgame, he's now created himself a new timeline. So by mm -hmm. doing that, he, he's, he hasn't seen the uh, events of Thor of the Dark World. He hasn't seen like that. So now he's taken out of sequence, and he's, un he's now uh, a prisoner of the Time Variant Authority. And what he's being tasked with is he can either be erased from history or he can go chase down someone that's killing members of this Time Variant Authority. So basically you're plunging Loki hmm. into a crime thriller. Okay. Uh, you have him... Uh, uh, you have him doing what he does, being Loki uh, as the god of mischief. Mm -hmm. But in the first episode, he has all his powers taken away from him. So you kind of have to get. So in this episode, in this first episode, you get him kind of stripping down and giving him explanation, giving him mythos. Hmm. Uh, you kind of okay. get a deeper hmm. understanding of the character with this one, and I think that's that's what these Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, TV series do is that they finally get to go more in depth into these characters that you've only seen 10 minutes of. It also does what Marvel Cinematic Universe does best, and that's taking B and C level heroes and raising them to A level status. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you have an actor who was, a, who was an infinitely talented as Tom Hiddleston yeah. and putting him in these sequences, you give him, the, you give him room to play. Yeah. And that's what's effective about this series. This one I don't think is going to be uh, within the same level as we we'll need to see as WandaVision, and it's not, I don't think, going to hit all its cylinders like Falcon and the Winter Soldier does. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be, it's going to be, it's weird because it's going to be half procedural crime thriller, half uh, buddy comedy. I, he's, he's, he's being paired with Owen, Owen Wilson on this, who is, who is really just... I don't care about being in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. He does not care. Mm -hmm. He's not a fanboy. Mm -hmm. So getting, getting him to kind of play off of that uh, and putting uh, the character in these kind of unique crime thriller circumstances, it's. I think it's not necessarily going to be one that you necessarily like need, 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 need to see. Mm -hmm. But if you're a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you definitely want to get into that in-depth, uh, character and you definitely kind of want to see what happens next mm -hmm. i'm in for the series because i do love the marvel cinematic universe i really yeah. enjoy tom hiddleston's performances and i really want to get into this one so uh hmm. and basically it, it's kind of fun to watch a god be undone by pure bureaucracy <laughs> that's the that that that's the rage that you get to see that it's go that it's one of the most powerful circum one of the most powerful wow uh, you know gods in the mm. Marvel universe being undone by pure bureaucracy because they take away his powers and you're putting him in a circumstance where he, he's not a threat he's, how do, he's how do literally you, not a threat how do you take away a god's powers <laughs> they found a way. <laughs> He's not much of a god then exactly. if you could take away his powers. Exactly. And that's and, and, and that's what and that's what makes it that's what makes this first episode kind of a trip because okay, you you you're giving you're basically giving Loki at his core, like what is he? A scared person. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. Well, it sounds complicated, but that doesn't mean it can't be interesting. And I, what I'm wondering about is, well, 
Loki, Loki's not a superhero. He's a villain that sometimes does things where he will work with the heroes, but it's not that he's necessarily established as, as a good guy. So that'll be interesting to see how they play with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That sounds like that could be pretty uh, interesting from that perspective. Yeah, the villain having to take on the hero's role. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be... Eh, 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 might be good. Not, yeah, not, not necessarily when you need to jump out and watch, but... Uh, yeah. You know, if you, if, you, if you got the Disney Plus, if you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this is, this is I think, going to be a six-episode run that you, you, you'll, you'll want to jump on. You'll want to binge once once it's there. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. That might be one of those things. Yeah. One of those things. Probably not the first thing I jumped to, like you said, but it could yeah. be one of those things. Yeah. But again, you're, you're, you're not exactly into the Marvel Cinematic Universe that in-depth or, you know, outside of, outside of a couple of the properties. So. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Well, it's because I read the comic books. That's exactly. what, that's what ruined it for me. Because <laughs> I know what I Oh, boo! <laughs> yeah. How dare you be a nerd? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's so, it's. <laughs> It's so crazy because it's like you have to – it's funny because like if you have a blank slate for the average person right. that's out there just watching, if you have a blank slate and you know nothing about Iron Man and you know nothing about Black Panther, if you know nothing about – then I could see where this could be the thing. But when I read these books and I thought this was fantastic how this world was created and then see, oh, here's our modernized version where we're going to stick in this and that and some social justice stuff and this and that and some stuff here and stuff there – at some point, I'm going, wow, wow. It's just, you've taken me so far from the original thing, which not all the time is that a bad thing no. at all, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I recognize that, but it's, it's the idea that this gets so formulaic for me that I, I just go, I have to watch something else just to balance the idea that I'm watching Iron Man, Black Panther, Ant-Man, every kind of man, every kind of woman basically do the same crap over and over again and then the only way we can make it interesting is if we take it pre something or post something so we have to do this time travel thing and it goes all over the place which again i get it you got to create some new stories you can't keep telling the story of batman fighting joker every time because eventually that's going to get boring so i get it but i'm not so sure (laughs) that this anybody would ever imagine that these comic book movies would take off to the direction that they have today and doing what they're doing today and so what i hope is is that that makes non-comic book films step up their game in the areas where they need to because i think there could be a a good contrast like i want to see more quiet place movies i'd rather Mm -hmm. see that more so than than you know here's a guy that you think you know that we're going to change and he's going to do this stuff and so that's where i get lost sometimes but again i'll pop in and watch something just to see you know, sometimes you have to see it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, it, th- this this is a this is going to be a TV series that's based off the strength of its main actor, which is Tom Hiddleston. And again, yeah. you're going into because he's cute and the girls want to see it, and yeah. so therefore, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> that's why he's getting it. It's, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, yeah. like I said, you're going you're going into an area of Marvel comics that isn't necessarily built off the comic franchise. Now you're really going into in depth into, uh, you know something that's not necessarily so in-depth and ingrained in the comics you're getting kind of out on your own which is what the marvel cinematic universe i think was kind of gained was kind of gauged to do yeah yeah i mean it, it could be it's just i guess if you start to change some core components of certain things that's where you kind of you it dilutes what you heard first so when you turn thor into a joking comic type gesture like you do in ragnarok mm. i'm just like that's not thor you read any of the Thor comic books? That's just not him. And you don't I don't like I, Lebowski Thor. I, 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 oh. That's that's an, that's, even <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> and see, that's what I mean. It's just no, kind of like this. You know what this no, is I like? Get it. I, yeah. I get no, it. I know you get it, but I'm just saying it's like to me. It's like this is what happened in Star Wars. Yes. Right. You take something that originally that was solid, great, and everything else, and then now all of a sudden. Now we turn it into, oh, yeah, so now Luke is the most pessimistic person in the universe instead of the most optimistic <laughs> and all this other crap. And you're just going, that's why didn't you just create a whole nother story, a whole nother movie? But because you needed the Star Wars branding to help people to pay attention, that's what I think I dis- that I don't like. That's yeah. the part that I feel like you would serve better if you just started your own crap and started your own universe, just like George Lucas did. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. So maybe, like I said, that could be the plus on this as a comic books fan because now you're seeing a comic book character kind of go out on his own in the MCU. Yeah, so, well, we'll so, see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into the reason why you may have clicked on this anyway based off the thumbnail. Well, actually, the thumbnail isn't out yet, but when you do see this, if some of you watch this later, uh, we're going to talk about the Asian films. Yes, there it is. 
And what we're talking about in many different ways is the the impact of these films and what they have done in terms to influence pop culture, uh, West Western film, uh, by the way. And and because of that, so many different genres when you look at them, and so a couple of key ones. And so we're just going to start talking about some of our favorites and why they were so impactful and and why you know, kind of tell you kind of behind the scenes like the reason why we do this now is because of this. And it started here, <laughs> though it may have been inspired by somewhere else. And so, Johnny, we'll start with just getting one of yours, and we'll go all the way around popcorn right. style as we do. So give us one. Okay. Um, <laughs> my number one pick uh, today is The Sword of Doom. It's a 1966 film. Uh, I will have to look at my notes to pronounce his name correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Kihachi Okamoto. Okay. Um, his director, Japanese director, um, Digging in on him a little bit, interesting. He was uh, conscripted during World War II, so a lot of his films then um, were influenced by kind of the horrors that he was exposed to in the in the war. Um, so he does tend to have a, a darker approach to films. Okay. Which is what I really, really like about The Sword of Doom. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful because... You know, in, in all of the samurai films that I've watched uh, across my lifetime, a, a lot of them yes. feature Toshiro Mifune, one of my all-time mm -hmm. favorite actors, mm -hmm. but also Tatsuya Nakadai. Okay. And Tatsuya Nakadai often played the villain opposite Toshiro Mifune, but Toshiro okay. Mifune was the protagonist in the film always. Well, in this case, things have been flipped. Mm. Okay. And Tatsuya Nakadai is not a good guy, but he is the main character. Hmm. He is evil to the core. Okay. And so this is a really interesting film. As a martial artist, um, I've studied a, a lot of Japanese culture and martial arts. And the summer I had a, a, a term they used called Kirisute Gomen. Mm -hmm. Essentially means to kill and walk away. Okay. So it was the idea that samurai had the right to cut someone down mm -hmm. and walk away mm -hmm. for dishonoring them. Now, this is often misunderstood, and that's one of the reasons that I like this film so much. Okay. Is that it was presumed by in, in, in Western culture that that meant that samurai were very cavalier and callous and would just kill people randomly mm -hmm. when that really just did not happen. And in the cases it did, like in this film, uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's character, Runsuke, uh, is very evil and just starts randomly murdering people that he comes across on the road. Mm -hmm. um, he, when he is confronted by good samurai, like Toshio Mifune's character. Okay. Uh, the the impulses to end that fight instantly, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so he is hunted down not only by Toshiro Mifune, mm -hmm. but by the the ghosts of his victims, and wow. his. Uh, so the film begins where with him being incredibly arrogant mm -hmm. because he knows he is a very excellent fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, to descending into madness as he's mm -hmm. haunted by <clears throat> his ghosts, the ghosts of his victims. is brilliant film. The, the, the photography is amazing. Uh, there's a scene in particular that really stands out for me. It's, it's beautiful. So it's at night in the snow. He, uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's character has been recruited by some, some criminals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help them um, assassinate a politician. Uh. So in the middle of the night and it's snowing and you've got this street at night, snow coming down, it's very dark, and there's a, there's a, a cart being carried down the street mm -hmm. and they assume it's this politician when in fact it's not. It's Toshiro Mifune's character mm -hmm. who's a samurai. Mm -hmm. being carried through the night and the all the people carrying the cart are attacked and Toshio Mifune comes out and uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's character doesn't draw his sword. He stands 
just to the edge of the screen, mm -hmm. watching the whole thing unfold. Mm -hmm. And I love it because Toshiro Mifune's character, as as he kills the first few, mm -hmm. he looks in the distance at Tatsuya Nakadai and says, mm -hmm. how dare you make me kill? <laughs> and it's a perfect juxtaposition mm -hmm. because Tatsuya Nakadai gets off on killing people mm -hmm. randomly. Mm -hmm. And here's this real samurai, mm -hmm. the real picture of honor, mm -hmm. saying, I didn't want to kill, but you forced me to. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, mm -hmm. that is the perfect mm -hmm. explanation okay. of samurai culture. And okay. I, I love it. I love it. I, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty sweet. How about you, K Zach? How are you going to follow that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see you follow that. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I will try. I will, well, it's hard to do. God. I will do my best. No, I'm no. going to talk about the film that we're without this film, we ain't having this conversation today. Oh, okay. Bring that. That is going to be. That is going to be, of course, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Yeah, there it is. 1954. Mm -hmm. uh, this film, honestly, it honestly is one of the best, if not my personal favorite. Film of the 20th century. Okay. okay. Um, everything about it is amazing. The light, the choreography, uh, and, and the fights, the performances, uh, the cinematography. Everything in this is beautiful. Uh, it, it is a three and a half hour, three and a half hour film bro broken up into two parts. And it is amazingly intense to watch. You're drawn to every character in this. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, you get uh, Toshiro Mifune uh, mm -hmm. coming in uh, as Kikuchiro, who wasn't who he, he wasn't actually originally supposed to be part of the film. Mm -hmm. They were going to do six samurai, but then they realized that we don't have the comic relief. We don't have uh, someone to kind of ground the film and give it heart, mm -hmm. and that's why they add him in. And he's he's improving a whole lot of his stuff. And one of his best performances. He was amazing. Oh, yeah. It, it, he is absolutely great as Kikuchiro. Uh, you also get a really grounded performance from Takashi Shimura as uh, Kambe Shiramana. Uh, and uh, like I said, he, he gives you that general. And very few films really give you the art of war. That's what this film does. It really just mm. brings to life the art of war. And mm -hmm. it goes into, uh, you know, how to build the tactics. And it goes into the lessons that you learn. And it mm. goes into, uh, you know, the complexities of being a soldier and being tired of fighting. And going in for a most noble cause. You know, there is no mm. glory in the... There, there, there is no riches in this. There is no uh, benefit in fighting for farmers, but there is a noble cause. And that's mm. the thing that you fight for, mm. is that the most noble cause possible. And that's, you know, to preserve the, the lives of these poor farmers. Mm. Uh, and again, you know, you get so many of the tropes that you see in today's film built within this film i mean I, I like i said i don't need to i don't need to give you film school on this because every film school reject who's yeah. seen this knows this film every yeah. film goer who loves cinema knows this film and i don't need to reiterate it but like i said it, the reason why i chose it is not because everyone's seen it it's because of the impact that it's had in pop culture uh because it goes from everything from all the way from uh uh, the Magnificent Seven, which of course is the is the Western uh, telling of this film, mm -hmm. uh, but also you have uh, stuff like Star Wars and Rogue One, uh, A Bug's Life, an animated film, Justice League, Avengers: Infinity War, uh, Mad Max: Fury Road, deliberately takes shots from the film and puts it into their own film. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it's That's true. so impactful, but like I said, it really speaks to the the gravity of the film. It speaks to the cinematics of the film. It speaks to the strength of the film how it's carried on for so long and it's still just a classic that you can watch again and again and just get the richness and fullness of what it means to be in a battle. Uh, uh, you get some really innovative techniques throughout the time uh, because you get three cameras capturing all the action because uh, uh, Kurosawa knows you're not going to get uh, yeah. what you got on screen yeah. in one take. You're getting telephoto yeah. lenses which weren't available or highly at the time. Uh, uh, they stopped production this a couple times because he's going over budget, and Kurosawa is just going, "No, nah, they put enough move, they put enough money in this. It's gonna make, they're gonna let me make the film." It's faith in the project, and he he's also uh, doing something that no editor is doing, and still no editor does at the time. He's editing at night. 
while the production is going on. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. where directors will go into the editing room and take months and months and months and months to edit a film. He's editing at night. He's putting it all together to mm-hmm. get it out as fast as possible. And it's, it's you know, like I said, technique and storytelling that is unsurpassed now to this day. And that's why it's so impactful in Western culture. Yeah. No. Wow. No. And that's, that's it's true. And you can't watch Star Wars and not see, right? Yep. And when yeah. you sit down and watch Seven yeah. Samurai, Any you film can't... that takes a ragtag bunch of uh, <laughs> individuals and send them to war. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for the past 70 years <laughs> yeah no that's true and you know the so for me the one i picked and i usually go three two one so i like to keep some sort of uh, interest in uh, you seeing what my number one is so i want to make you to stay and watch a little longer because uh, i know how some people are on youtube you watch the first 10 minutes and then you maybe you jet out so i'm for those who are hanging in there with me then you got to hang in to see what that number one is but um at three i again i couldn't step away from it but i also am a big fan of Akira Kurosawa's um, Hidden Fortress. So this mm-hmm. is this is 1958, just four years after another big juggernaut that's also on my list, you know. Uh, and so now, when you watch this film <laughs> and then watch Star Wars, you go, yeah. "Oh, two peasants that are arguing and fighting back and forth." Tihi and Matashihi. Um, when you watch them, you go, you say, wow, that looks a lot like R2-D2 and R2 and C-3PO as they bitter, they bat, they go back and forth and they do this bunch of crazy shenanigans and then there's one turning on the other and wanting to leave the other and leave the other one behind and all this stuff. So you've got this script that revolves around for the, one of the first times in movie history where it wasn't focused on the, the lead characters. You almost ask, who is this focused around, right? So you get like tertiary characters kind of leading this at the beginning. So it, it's revolving around these two peasants at first. And so these two peasants, they are greedy. They are willing to do some uh, unscrupulous things uh, when they find out that there is a, a princess um, that is still alive when these two clans have actually gone after each other. And one of the interesting things about this is that Kurosawa used two real clans. These weren't just some actors coming in. He used two real clans. So it's historically accurate in terms of uh, the feel. And then that cinematography gets pulled in because of that. Like the big duel that you see, it's not swords. They're using spears, which would have been more accurate based off of what these clans would have used. So I, th- that attention to that kind of detail was wonderful. And then when you get to the center of the story of this particular clan having this gold and who can get it and who can steal it, who's taking it and this sort of thing, then right when these the two characters, the two main characters, these peasants start to kind of fizzle out because you're kind of going, okay, where are y'all going to go with this? What else are y'all going to do? Then that's when you bring in the princess and you bring in uh, the character. Uh, I'm trying to say this correctly because it's the same thing. I, I want to give this the, the, what it deserves. So uh, Maccabi Rakairoto, I think, is the name of of the other um, character that's in here who's with the princess and basically kind of protecting her. And so um, when you see how they all of a sudden start to take center stage, you start to go, well, what about the peasants? And then you start to realize, well, the peasants weren't the main key focus here, but it was showing something about the character of all people, right? Whether you're higher social status or lower social status, the greed that you can have, the looking out just for self, the lack of honor (laughs) of all of this. Mm -hmm. And then this one wasn't like super flashy, this film for, so when Kurosawa was doing this one, it was nothing like the way he had done Seventh Samurai at all, right? And and it was him trying to stretch and grow as a director to say, I wanna show honor, but I also wanna show the human condition and I can still show it, maybe within the people who you don't think should be at the top or rungs of whatever the echelon is of the caste system. And so you get this interesting take of, well, here are these two guys that are going to try to, once they figure out where they're at and who they can probably rob from and where they can go with it and what they could possibly do having this princess so located into the story, then you start to see, wow, okay, this is not what I expected. I thought the good honorable samurai is going to come in and fight the bad guy and he might be a samurai that's on a bad take and then there they go. But here, that's that's not the case. And so when you put this up against Star Wars, <laughs> and especially when you watch the scenes of C-3PO and R2-D2, you, you just go, wow. And then the idea of the princess 
being uh, captured, but then still super powerful. <laughs> then you see the princess, you see Princess Yuki here in that. And so there's just so many ways where when I watched this, I thought, okay, I see it now. And, th and I've heard some people have argued that, well, I don't know, this could have been any film that you could have said that the R2-D2 and C-3PO was matched. And they say this because of, um, of an interview with Lucas, where Lucas does mention it, but because of his tone and the way he says it, people think he's just throwing it away when he says it. But you'd have to know George Lucas all the time to know if that's what he was doing. But George Lucas does acknowledge that he that had a big influence, and that technique of storytelling is what helped him understand the different characters. Because notice you don't meet Luke right away. Right. You meet C-3PO and R2-D2 way before you meet Luke. And so you can see a nod to that. What do you think, Kazak? And then I want to hear Johnny. <laughs> I, no, go, go ahead, John, because... <laughs> oh, man, you, you covered it pretty well. I don't really have anything yeah. to add to it except that the Hidden Fortress is definitely a very influential film that was excellent. Yeah. 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 I mean, and think about the storytelling. So the idea that you can start with two characters who aren't the main character and then make them interesting enough to where by the time you bring on the characters who you might focus on somewhat towards the middle to the end without it feeling like the other guys didn't need to be in there because they seem to be tacked down, tacked on, that's a pretty interesting feat. Well, and, and, and really, that is art, yeah. you know? Communication, and uh, it, it's, it's no different than composition in a photograph either. Okay. If, if it's just the subject... There's no, there's no interest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There has to be other elements involved that draw you into the frame. Yeah. So yeah, and and it's a brilliant film for that reason. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. And there's something to be said for Lucas and Lucas's filmmaking in the film that there's a great, there's a great adage that said, "Good artists borrow." Great artist steal. <laughs> <laughs> and Lucas knew who to steal from to yes, make it an impactful yes. story. Yes, Lucas knew exactly what he was doing <laughs> when he put these <laughs> elements into his film. Because again, they're not films that get they're not points that get made in Western film. Yes. yes. So he's reaching into the culture of this film and going, you know what? We can translate this to an American audience. We can get you to understand. Because like I said, like you said, it is a human understanding of art and the fact that these are basically universal themes that anyone can, can get into. And this is what helps you grit your teeth into uh, films like this. Yes. Yeah. And, and honestly, looking at what we're doing right now, talking about this mm -hmm. is, is a really interesting juxtaposition against what we've been having to deal with with films lately of mm -hmm. how everything is monotonous yeah. and formulaic. Yeah. The, the Asian films really dig deep into human concepts. Yeah. Yeah. I like that, that it's built from the inside out rather than from the outside trying to put it in. Yep. Right. So like today it's like, it's built off of the intellectual properties. If it's popular, then we're going to make a movie about it. Cause we know we have a built in tribe that'll come see it. Whereas here, this isn't what's what you would see stepping into it at all. This is just, no, we're going straight to the human conditions of what's honorable, what isn't honorable, and then how do we behave, and how do some of us even define honorable? Yes. And, can, and can you regain honor if you've lost it? I mean, mm -hmm. all these themes mm -hmm. right there. And you have to say, as a, as a cinephile at all, you have to say that. That's incredible. So you have to go back. if you If you really want to know how movies... Um, had so much more heart and soul, I would say. You got to go older. And there's a few new ones that are yeah. still trying to do it, right? So we know No Country for Old Men was a great one, and so was uh, Hell or High Water, and there's a few others, you know. Um, but if you want to go back, you have to go back to the 50s and 60s, and mm -hmm. some of the 70s as well, because the 70s were influenced by the 50s and 60s. Yep. All right. And that was about people. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the films of the technology. 70s, yeah, I mean, this, the films of the seventies were getting more into a human condition and things like that. Uh, and so, like I said, the the, art, the the filmmakers of that time, which you know, uh, you're getting Coppola, you're getting uh, you're getting Spielberg, you're getting uh, all the guys from the U, from USC going, hey, or, uh, the UCLA UC, USC uh, mm -hmm. film school, and going, hey, you know what? These themes that were built here can finally translate over here. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, you're getting the grit and the deeper understanding of human culture. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. totally great. So give us another one. What's another good one, Kay, uh, Johnny? Uh, Hero, directed in 20, uh, 2002 by Yimou Zhang. Okay. Um, this one is on my list 
because everything that we've been discussing since I've joined this show, mm -hmm. including CGI, mm -hmm. cinematography, the mm -hmm. storytelling, everything, I would have to say that Hero, for me, mm -hmm. is possibly the the best one of the best films ever films that okay, brings <laughs> all of that together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay it's a it's a stunning film so uh Jet Li, one of my favorite actors yeah plays a, a nameless very low level bureaucrat okay who is summoned to the king of the kingdom of Chin, mm -hmm. because he has been trying to unite all six of the Chinese kingdoms under him as one nation, mm -hmm. and assassins have been trying to take him out for years because of that. There's mm -hmm. been wars, mm -hmm. and this lowly, nameless bureaucrat mm -hmm. has succeeded in killing three mm -hmm. of the assassins. So he's summoned and brought closer and closer to tell his story to this king. Mm -hmm. And the way the stories are told are just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. They use the CGI beautifully. Mm -hmm. It's almost seamless. It flows. Mm -hmm. You you know that it's CGI because it's grander than life. Sure. But it doesn't look it doesn't look intensely like CGI. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the use of colors mm -hmm. and the the movement and the action mm -hmm. in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Every kingdom has its own color, so mm -hmm. you get complete saturation of red or mm -hmm. complete mm -hmm. saturation mm -hmm. of green throughout mm -hmm. it, and it's. That alone is stunning, and mm -hmm. and I don't know personally enough about Chinese mm -hmm. culture to know mm -hmm. what all of the different colors signify to right. them. Right. I know there are other elements there that I'm missing. Sure. Um, but then you also have these these wonderful characters in the assassins. So as as Nameless is telling the King of Chin all of these stories of defeating these other assassins. Mm -hmm. You're getting these wonderful characters out of these other assassins. They're not mm -hmm. just, oh, yeah, I killed him. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're seeing this one character who is making these massive brush mm -hmm. paintings, mm -hmm. these gigantic movements of mm -hmm. the brush as you're mm -hmm. seeing arrows flying through the air in clouds of arrows. Mm -hmm. And it's... It's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like you get drawn into it so deeply. Mm -hmm. If more movies were made like Hero, mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. people would never leave the theater. <laughs> and and here's an element to this film that I've not brought up in any other film, mm -hmm. and that is the score. Mm -hmm. So that was it was scored by. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, mm -hmm. but it's Tan Dun, mm -hmm. phenomenal composer. Mm -hmm. I, I I loved this score so much that I went out and and listened to more of his compositions. He's written phenomenal symphonies, um, mm -hmm. but the the percussion in mm -hmm. this score mm -hmm. it it brings in this this primal element to everything and it's just it's beautiful mm, okay hero. have you watched hero it was so long ago like you're talking about uh, 2002 there's very few films that i still remember yeah for some reason i think just because of the glut of information that i take in a lot as a researcher and everything right. so i just can't and I'm now now the thing is if i were to put it on quickly it would come back yeah and i'd be like okay this is the part where he's gonna go in here right but just i, I can't stack it <laughs> so so we already had like crouching tiger hidden dragon and some yeah. other films that that were 
pretty epic on this grand scale also. Yeah. But this particular director followed up with um, uh, House of Flying Daggers, which was also beautiful in the exact yeah. same way. And Curse of the Golden Flower, which I have not seen. Yeah. And Shadow mm -hmm. is, is one of his more recent ones. And he turns the saturation completely down to where it's almost pure black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and by golly, if it weren't for Hero, like mm -hmm. it, it just brings everything together. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to put that on my list again. <laughs> and yeah. Kzak, how about you? All right. Um, so the next film that I'll talk about is the film that launched a thousand fandoms. Uh, <laughs> it it I, again it, it it most of you if you watch film you know what I'm talking about and that is 1988's Akira, uh, directed by Katsuhiro Otomoto. Uh, 5.5 million dollar budget, 160,000 hand painted animated cells, in addition to computer animation, makes it one of the big was it was the biggest and most expensive anime ever created until the following year when Kiki's Delivery Service came out uh, uh, from the Miyazaki studio. So basically, hmm. what you're getting with this film is basically uh, it it's a film that turned the corner on. Children's animation to adult animation. It's the film that everyone in their dorms that had that guy that watched uh, cartoons said, you've got to see this film. Because hmm. you went down the hall and you watched this film. And it, it, is, it is not just a film. It's an experience because it's visual and it's surreal. It tells the story of uh, 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 a young man who's involved in a terrible motorcycle accident in the wake psychic abilities and basically pretty much grows up to doom the universe. Uh, it's based on a 2,000-page manga from 1982, uh, they, which was which they really had to cut it in half to get down to a 758-storyboard-page pa uh, book to get down to this movie. So you're getting you're even missing a second half of it. And I mean, the film is so comprehensive and gorgeous and surreal that it is truly a remarkable piece of animation. Uh, and it, uh, again, that more opening motorcycle slide has probably been parodied in. Or any anim has probably been parodied more in any animated franchise than any other scene ever. Uh, you've got uh, it's the first animated film that was ever released as part of the Criterion Collection, uh, and was the first in 20 years up to the Fantastic Mr. Fox. Mm -hmm. So that that kind of tells you exactly just how impactful the film is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it it again you see uh, impacts of the film in uh, uh, American films like The Matrix and uh, uh, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Uh, Star Wars, of course, uh, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, you're getting, uh, you know, references to it in episodes of South Park and Rick and Morty. Uh, uh, even uh, Michael Jackson's Scream features cuts from Akira. So you, you've mm. got to understand just how impactful mm. the film is. Like I said, I to go into kind of, you know, the depths of, uh, you know, what the film means and things like that. It's it's it would be impossible. It would take another hour, but. The fact is, is that it's a film that really, really deserves to be seen, and not just seen, but also enjoyed and experienced and watched. And again, it, 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 if you're if you're sober, it's great. If you're on something, it could be even better. That's that's your call. <laughs> if you go in with that, that's fine. Because I mean, it, it it is just an assault on the senses, from the score <laughs> to the visuals. All of it is just. We're not pro drugs, strange. people. No. We're not pro drugs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're not pro drugs, but you know, it. it, 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 it but just want to make the clarification. That's okay. But it's a film that really is almost an altered state because it is just so out there and so expansive and broad. It it deserve it. It deserves to be seen on the big screen, on the small screen. You're going to take in every little detail. But again, like I said, I call it the film that launched a thousand fandoms because sure. it it really launched the love for anime back in this country. Uh, it really, uh, like I said, uh, it starts off, you know, just love for uh, Japanese animation here in this country. Uh, it really kind of, uh, it's it's a fandom, and it's just so much that it's hard to encapsulate just how impactful the film ha the film has been in American culture because of its deep roots uh, and what it's built into. But like I said, when you Consider the effort that was put into getting this film out uh, by the toy company. It's just amazing. Yeah, wow. yeah. No, that's for sure. <laughs> for sure. Definitely belongs in this discussion, no doubt at all. 
Um, my second one then is I, I did pick something that we pretty much um, every person kind of knows a bit about this. It's a film in 1954, Gajira, right? Mm. And so we're talking about Ishi Honda, um, Ishiro Honda, who decided this is going to be something I'm going to write and have have writers, um, which was his, his name was uh, Kayama. And what's interesting about this is, again, look at the date, 54. So it's nine years after the bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, right? And so to take this idea and say, well, we want to create something that's anonymous to or actually analogous to the bombs and the effects of what happened when that bomb was dropped and how people were scorched and killed and all this stuff. And even better, I think people miss this about the movie. The movie... Uh, Gajira was not about Gajira. It was about mankind. Because in the movie, if you haven't seen it, um, there's a scientist who was willing, <laughs> who was willing to kill Godzilla and himself at the same time and sacrifice because he didn't want anyone to have the plans to the bomb that he was going to create, the oxygen bomb that he was going to use to kill Godzilla. And the reason was because he did, he, if it fell into the wrong hands. So the film really is about yeah, you see Gajira coming in and he has they have to introduce it and show what he does. But it's really about the evilness of mankind, what would happen, which again sounds kind of interesting to something we talked about that came out four years later in Hidden Fortress, right? So here we go. We have Godzilla. And so what's interesting about this in so many ways, so like the, the American version, Godzilla comes out two years after in 56, right? But we're talking about 54. And so here... What's incredible is, is, is when you look at the special effects, that's the first big choice I thought was interesting because they chose men in suits over stop motion, which is what Mighty Joe Young and King Kong was made out of, which they had seen, right? They had seen those films. And so the idea that they said, no, we're going to do suits because this is going to be cheaper and what we thought would be easier. But the problem was most of the actors, most of the stuntmen in the suits fainted mm -hmm. most of the time. So what they ended up doing was whenever they just need to show Godzilla's legs, the actor was only wearing the bottom part of the suit. <laughs> and when they needed to show just the top part, then he didn't have the legs on in certain parts when they were just filming from a, a chest high view of Gajira. So it's very, very interesting how ingenuity once again steps up, just like George Lucas used ingenuity before CGI to create mm -hmm. something. And here it is with this whole men in suits, which lasted until 2004. Right when CGI was really starting to, to come on. So for all those movies, and by the way, Gajira, right? There's no series that's run longer in the movies hmm. than Gajira. There are more Godzilla movies than any other movie. There's not enough Star Wars movies. There's not enough, uh, well, Fast and the Furious, whatever, if they're still making those. I guess they still they are. F9, yeah, right? <laughs> you don't want Disney to buy this franchise. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> And then again, toy company you'll never sell. <laughs> never. <laughs> right? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and then this is what starts the genre of kaiju's, basically, right here with this. It yeah, wasn't the stop yeah. motion films before. It was this film here that kicked off yeah. the whole craze of this. And so these films, the impact of Japanese audiences was to see that yeah, we understand this. And so another piece of this is whenever they show Godzilla for the very first time, the sounds of him walking, right, like a Jurassic Park when mm. you hear the sounds. The sounds on purpose, again, you know I'm very sensitive to sound design, was to sound like every step sounded like the bombs that were dropped. They don't sound like footsteps. If you go back and watch the film, it sounds like then. So he was asked, did you do this on purpose, uh, Ishiro? And he said, of course. What do you think? Because he was really trying to draw that parallel that, hey, this was just nine years ago. Yeah that this happened in real life. And so now here's our reimagining of it and here's what we think. And so great special effects. Um, um, to Subriara, um, was magnificent in creating those destruction scenes because destruction was actually there and they had seen it. So therefore the cinematography is shot from the ground going up because it's shot from the perspective of people who would have survived or seen or was around it. So they knew that that would tie into Japanese audiences and immediately they could make that connection and forget that it's a man in a suit knocking over toys yeah. in dark lighting and then in some bright lighting as well. So again, just the ideas of putting this all together and all-star cast also Everybody remembers uh, Takahashi uh, Shimura. I'm looking at his name so I can pronounce it right because he's that scientist who had a very much a kamikaze attitude. He was willing to say, I'm willing to go down with my invention to kill this thing so that everyone else is safe. And the movie ends on a very sad and somber note because it wasn't like they were just blowing things up and, hey, we got rid of Godzilla. It was just like a man 
died, but it was so that he could protect many others afterwards. Not so much that Gajira was killed. So again, a lot with this. I could yeah. say more, but there's, this has been talked about a lot. But what do you guys think? I mean, wasn't that just, what was your first Godzilla film? Maybe I should just say it that way. <laughs> hmm. um, honestly, I haven't watched, but maybe one, I think. So, yeah, um, yeah this, uh, that's, you've got my interest on this one. I'm definitely going to go Go check that one out. Yeah, it's a slow burn. So I know today everything's about fast action, so it's a slow burn. But if you get past that and you just watch it and think about the, some of the things I said in terms of how they were setting this up, you'll see the – if you're a history buff too, you'll see yeah. why they were doing a lot of this. It yeah. sounds brilliant. Uh, I think my first was probably Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. Okay. I, I'll say that. But, yeah, I, I, I would encourage – uh, like I said, our audience members, uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, go back a couple of weeks and go check out our show with uh, Cole Houston. Go check out our love of uh, uh, of the Kaiju Monster. Yes. So definitely go check out that episode. Yes, yes, yes. So finally, we'll get into our last piece here. Johnny, what's your last one? My last one is both another remake <laughs> and another Jet Li film. Okay. So this is Fist of Legend. Love that one. Which is a remake of Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury. Yes. And this one was directed by Gordon Chan in 1994. And there are several things that I really appreciate about this. This is actually the first Jet Li film I ever watched. And I gained such a respect for him and his, his choices in films from this one. Prior to that, I didn't watch many Chinese films. I, I st stayed pretty strictly to the Japanese and, and mm -hmm. samurai films. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's so many of the old kung fu films that are pretty ridiculous. Sure. Especially for a martial artist. They're mm -hmm. fine! <laughs> They're, <laughs> They're fine! fine. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <They're> fine. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that as, 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 you know, I've kicked a lot of trees, but I'm pretty sure I've never kicked anybody through a, through a second story building or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. I'm with um, you. Tell me you've never drunkenly danced like Jean-Claude Van Damme, I'm ashamed. <laughs> Just saying. Oh my God, uh, <laughs> a Jacques von Clendem reference and, 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 on this show. What's the world coming to? Oh, oh. <laughs> forget you, man. Kickbox is a classic. Sure. Oh no, Shush. no, no. Oh. no that sick boxer. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I anyway, do, John. what I what I do really love about Fist of Legend yeah. is that it is it is a very classic. Mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. of the, the the hero who has left home mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, to explore the world to learn new things to you know and then returns home to find his home is in chaos mm -hmm. and now has to step up and mm -hmm. and take charge because in in, in fist of legend and yeah. fist of fury mm -hmm. um uh, Chen Zhen has gone to Tokyo, mm -hmm. as was very common in those days. The Chinese and the Koreans would go to Tokyo to study at the university. Well, he returns home to Shanghai uh, with, when the Japanese have occupied China in, sure. in the 1930s. And to discover that his master has died, everybody just kind of shrugged their shoulders, and he discovers that his master was actually poisoned by the Japanese general. Mm-hmm. And his, all of his fellow students in this school have pretty much shrugged their shoulders and given up. They're all hanging their heads and they're all walking around like they've been defeated. And he walks in and goes, this is nonsense. And he takes the fight to the Japanese and starts teaching and starts leading. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the, the, the feelings of accomplishment starts to permeate out into mm -hmm. everybody and mm -hmm. you see people rally around him and 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 come back to life mm -hmm. uh and, and so it's it's a it's a wonderful yeah. story i agree uh and the fight scenes they're phenomenal 
I, mm-hmm. I, I love them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jet Li is a real martial artist, and, yes. and I have so much respect for him as a martial artist. Yeah. But he's also one of the few that I think has carried that into cinema in an incredibly successful way okay. with without much of the ridiculousness that has come along with it. Yeah. yeah. So Fist of Legend. Yeah. Uh, honestly, even as a remake, mm-hmm. watch Fist of Legend. I am... Mm-hmm. Bruce Lee will always have a, a special place in cinema. Sure. But I think Jet Li did this far better. I agree. And I talked about this before on one of the topics we did. Maybe it was a year or two years ago on an episode. And I used that as a hot take. I said, you know, the, the Fist of Legends is to me. And I know it was crazy for you know others to hear it. But I, Fist of Legends to me was much better than Fist of Fury. And there's... Some of it's the storyline yes. is ridiculous the way it was presented then. Mm-hmm. And then Fist of Legends, I think the action was just was better and it wasn't just focused on one person being great. Yes. Most yes. of the people in that ensemble were great. <laughs> yes. They so, really were. Yeah. They really were. And and it's interesting to note also that um this was dubbed in English because they did they didn't mm-hmm. speak English. Sure. So so like there there is that. There is some of the typical issues with the dubbing. Sure. But what I what I really love thinking back about it and, and rewatching certain scenes, uh, Jet Li's expressions mm-hmm. on his face, mm-hmm. you see so much of the emotion and the conflict and the turmoil in him through his facial expressions. So even though it's not his voice, mm-hmm. it works mm-hmm. really well. Yeah. That's good. So good. What about you, Zach? All right. So my last film that I'm going to talk about today, for better or worse, uh, launched a whole lot of teen angsty apocalypse movies, and I'm talking about the 2000s Battle Royale. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. You, you you can you can hate on the genre if you it, but I mean like oh, I said no. without the film without the film you don't get Hunger Games without the film you don't get Divergent uh, without the film you don't get I don't condemned. mind <laughs> 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 it, 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 it is very much based uh, it is very much based in it, it's pretty much forecasted reality TV shows and game shows it's fine it's even hosted by the host of uh, the the main teacher in it uh, is. Uh, uh, beat Takeshi, uh, aka the host of Takeshi's Castle, which you've ever seen most extreme uh, elimination challenge. That's exactly what it is, uh, which kind of led a, a weird gravitas to the film. Hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, you have uh, 42 students chosen from a high school uh, uh, class at random to go basically go on an island and kill each other with one remaining uh, at, under the th- under the thumb of a totalitarian go- a totalitarian government. Uh, again, it, it's a variation of the most dangerous game, not something original. But the violence in the film is original. Uh, you know, you're, you're getting guys who, you're, you're getting students going up against, someone might get uh, a hammer, someone might get an axe, someone might get a gun, someone might get a pot lid. It, 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 it just goes all over the place <laughs> with the violence. But the violence is over the top. Uh, Quentin Tarantino uh, praised this as his favorite film. Uh, even going so far as to cash Battle Royale? In, yeah. <laughs> he literally, that's okay. what he said. It's okay. his favorite film. Uh, he also casts uh, Chiaki Kuriyama, uh, as, uh, uh, who played Tak- Takako in the film, mm-hmm. as uh, Gogo Yubari in Kill Bill because of her performance. Um, the film didn't get any traction when it was first released. It, it never got a, uh, an official U.S. release until it went direct to DVD uh, because the uh, the, gov- uh, the filmmakers were so concerned about the, uh, the violence and things like that. The government the, declared it rude and crass and things like that. Uh, and it didn't get really a grip in, the, in America until it got released in 2010 uh, thanks to Anchor Bay uh, with the direct-to-video release. Uh, it never got released in theaters and the thing is is that it was made in 2000 and comes they only tried to release it and looked at doing it with test audiences right after Columbine. So that's why it never really got in traction here until it got a, a following on video. But again without this you don't get a Hunger Games. You don't get a diversion. You don't get that uh, dramatic teen violent movie until this. So, like I said, for better or for worse, it's an influential film. 
Wow. No, I, okay. Yeah, no, I want to check it out. Actually, I haven't yeah. seen it. It's, I haven't so, either, but it sounds interesting. It, it, yeah, it's wonderfully, it it's over the top violence. That's yeah. that's exactly what it is. Over top violence between teens, and that's exactly what it is. Ah, uh, okay. Well, then. Go and expect nothing less. Yep. Okay. Well, I've, I've got my mindset now. Now I know what mindset I need to have when I watch that film. And so, mine, my last one, uh, number one. Out of all those, and Godzilla was tough, you know, to try to top that in terms of impact and influence on the culture here in the West. That would be a movie that came out in 1981 that was based off of a novel that was written in 1991 by Koji Suzuki. This film, directed by uh, Hideo Nakata, is called Ringu. All right? Now, mm -hmm. this put J-horror on the map. This particular film, Ringu, spawned like nine other films um based off of it so there were there were two that were sequels three that were spinoffs one that was a korean remake and then two american adaptations of this film 1998 this put j-horror on the map for other people in north america and other places because they didn't realize the difference in japanese horror versus american cinematic horror so the bigger difference here and what i love is is that um j-horror is slow slow build versus action driven pace maybe of just killing 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 and then they'll dive into the family and this culture piece there's always a family piece in these j-horror films because culture in that culture japanese culture family is the biggest thing and so you get this movie ringu which is about uh this tape that if anybody watches this tape they're cursed. They get the curse of Sadako, and they will die within seven days. Sadako was a, was a girl that was killed by her father, and she was thrown into a well, but she was alive for seven days before she finally eventually perished. And so that's why the curse says you have seven days. And like Scream, on that seventh day, you get this call, and there's this decrepit voice that you don't even know what it's saying. It's just making a noise that's just weird. And so in this film... Um, you have this character that's a, a journalist who says, well, I'm going to go look up this stuff because this stuff really happens. I want to look and see if this is really what, what's really going on. And so now to understand what's happening, she has to watch the tape because she's trying to see supposedly, right? And then she shows it, weirdly, to her ex-husband. And then <laughs> at some point, her son ends up watching oh, the man. tape. And she's scared to death about, oh, my God, what you just saw. And she's asking her little boy, why did you watch this? And he's saying, oh, um, Ocho told me, which is his, uh, one of the women that were killed earlier in the films, one of the teenage girls uh, that you find out later is a niece of this particular journalist. And he's saying, I was told to watch this film through the death of, you know, o you know of Ocho. And she's like, oh, my God, I have to make sure that if this is true, what can we do? How can we protect it? Can we reverse it in some kind of way? So this is what you're watching. And so you've got powerful sound in that sometimes it's just nothing. And it's sitting there. And where American horror movies love to use jump scares, that's not the case with the Japanese horror films. They don't use jump scares like if they do one, it's not like that. It's actually a part of it because they took the sound from being dead silent to now we have to make a noise because this particular entity is going to break through, right? So this works in the 90s because you had a you had an economic issue in Japan back in those days. And whenever you have economic issues, fear creeps up. So this was the perfect breeding ground for horror films because horror films, mostly the Japanese, they were looking at, at uh, the spirituality. They were looking at fear itself. And then, of course, just the natural unknown, like what's going to happen to us if we don't get our the economy turned right size? What, what will we do? So these movies played right into that fear of Japanese audiences. And then eventually when Americans really saw it, they said, oh, my gosh, this is a completely different way of telling the story. And back to what we were saying earlier about the kung fu films and the martial arts films. Again, it's based on family. Oddly, in this film, <laughs> the lead character is going to give this tape then to her um granddad because she recognizes if other people watch the tape then maybe that'll take take her sadako away from cursing her son and maybe go after her family which again there's i didn't say all of it makes sense <laughs> but it's there and it really doesn't make sense of knowing that the culture of the family in japan is what it is but this particular deal also showed a social message saying also about the fear of technology because sadako is also coming out of tv screens yes. so what's going to happen to us by the things that we see and the things that we perceive 
So then, therefore, when Sadako does show up, you know, the entity here, it's just people freeze and they just don't know quite what to do. And then she's got telekinesis later on and she's able to really get in people's minds and make them imagine something more horrible than her doing anything to them, which is also something else incredible about a horror film. Instead of just being a slasher coming in, killing and chopping and all this sort of thing, you don't know what it is that's affecting this person to just freeze like a deer in headlights and then how this person is imagining the horrible thing that Sadako's using to make this person straight up die from it. Mm. <laughs> so again, Ringu, this is one that you have to watch. They released Ringu and Raisin at the same time, which was a curious decision, which was kind of stupid because nobody watched Raisin. They watched Ringu. So it'd be like releasing Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back on the same day. For some dumb reason, they did that. So then they had to make a Ringu 2 because nobody watched Raisin. And when they did, they were like, what? So <laughs> yeah, but this, this changed horror. And in the 90s, it's horror was starting to ramp up, and now we got yet another style. Yep. It's kind of like when the Beatles came over here to America to do pop music. That's what J-Horror did here. Yep, with this, you got uh, stuff like Jew on the Grudge. You yes. got yeah. uh, Dark uh, one, Waters. One this Call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and things like that. Uh, and like I said, it also did awaken uh, uh, folks to uh, for a taste for J-Horror and things like that. And then that's how you get stuff like audition and, ta and Takashi Miike getting a foothold in America. Oh my so, gosh, yeah. yes. Yes, and so Ringu then is to Japan what The Exorcist was here in America. So that's like, that's the power of this. So if you haven't seen Ringu and the originals, I would tell you the American version, The Ring, it's, it's fine. It's, it's colorized and it's this fine. sort of thing. It's, it's fine. fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but if you want Ringu and you just can sit still and you're okay with the slow burn and letting you learn something about these characters and these people, then when you watch Ringu and then Ringu 2, it will creep you out because of what's not implied that shows up versus them telegraphing what what's going to happen next because of a jump scare you gotta love a japanese ghost story all yes, right yes. pj let's get out of here man all right so we're on our way out so uh shout outs johnny who are you shouting out to uh today shouting out to courtney okay you okay Zach? uh shout outs to uh uh of course, uh, DallasOnAir.com. Uh, do check out all the all the shows here, uh, including Fan and Wife, including uh, Isle of Toys, including uh, the Rancor Pit. And, of course, uh, like I said, shout-outs to Jansen and Cantor. Give us a home here uh, every Sunday. Uh, we appreciate them. And, uh, uh, of course, I just want to kind of give a memorial shout-out uh, to my mom. It's uh, It would have been her birthday today. So, uh -huh. yeah. 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 Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Uh, for me, shout out's going to go to Brandy and Barry Austin, Sean Presley, Lauren Weedauer, Tristan Fraser, Harry Thomas, uh, Troy Ross, Michael Paul, Daniel Meza, Mad Mel, um, Eddie Medina, of course, and Cole Houston, Stephanie Crane, Scott Laney, and Sandra, and the film samurai himself, Carlos Salinas. And that's what we have for today. So tune in next time. We're always here. Fulfillment's always here on the second sunday and the fourth sunday of the month unless we do some sort of swapping with some of the other folks but until then we'll see you uh on that fourth sunday we're out of here peace Sign up.